It's the Dev Rant Podcast. Welcome to the Dev Rant Podcast. I'm David Fox, or as you might know me on Dev Rant, D Fox. And I'm Tim Rogus, aka T Rogus. We've got quite the show for you today. First, we're excited to share a talk with Eugenie Jim Brickman, a seasoned software developer, entrepreneur, and author of the book, Hello Startup. Then we have a DevRant community member to share his popular rant, some community Q&A, and end with some DevRant news and updates. Our talk with Jim is informative, lots of useful ideas around defining your own role as a programmer, incrementalism, A-B testing, and transitioning from a developer to an entrepreneur. Good stuff, David. Let's do it. We're happy to welcome Yevgeny Brickman as the featured guest on this episode of the DevRant Podcast. For those not familiar, Yevgeny, who goes by the slightly easier to pronounce name Jim, is the co-founder of DevOps shop Gruntwork and is the author of an O'Reilly book, Hello Startup, a programmer's guide to building products, technologies, and teams. Jim, welcome to the DevRant Podcast. Thank you guys for having me. I'm happy to be here. Uh, So to start back before you started your career, what first got you excited about programming and computers? I think, like a lot of other programmers, um, one of the things that got me into tech was actually games. So I used to play a lot of games as a kid, um, all the usual ones. Uh, So I I, I played a bunch of computer games because we had a computer at home. So it was like Civilization, Half-Life, and Warcraft, and all these things. And then at some point, I came across the game uh, Rainbow Six. It was like based on some Tom Clancy book. It was a shooter game. Um, really got into that game. And at some point, I just started digging through the files of the game and found out, oh, my God, you can edit a text file. And all of a sudden in the game, you have these super powerful grenades that like blow up the whole house. <laughs> 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 or you can replace an image, and all of a sudden your your own face, uh, kind of weirdly stretched and distorted, um, ends up in the game as well. So sort of hacking around with games and all of this stuff, spending a lot of time on the computer. And then I guess at some point a, a friend of mine showed me, uh, he, he built his own homepage on GeoCities. And sh- if you guys <laughs> remember GeoCities. <laughs> yes. Uh, and he showed me uh, how to do the same. And so that was, I guess, the very first, if you can call writing HTML programming, I guess it's programming, um, was, uh, yeah, right, building a homepage on GeoCities with, you know, the usual animated, like, spinning skull image and the under construction signs and all, all, all this stuff. Were you in a web ring? No, no, I was not. <laughs> I was not that savvy. I was just blown away that I could have a thing on the internet that people could go to and see <laughs> all over the world. It was just really mind-blowing and it was also very fun to have that uh, cycle where you you make some kind of a change and then you have some kind of visual feedback right you refresh the page and you Mm -hmm. see see the thing updated and i think that got me really addicted to programming like right away and just any language any tool set where you can like make a change and see your ideas appearing on a page um is just awesome so i think that got me into it and then I guess when I was in high school, I took a programming class. I taught myself some visual basic. Anyway, long story short, I ended up with summer jobs where I was, you know, making good money in an air conditioned office doing like random programming tasks while all my friends were flipping burgers and stuff. So it was, it was pretty clear this was, this was a nice way to go. Very cool. Living a good life. Yeah. Uh, so I looked up your uh, your career background. It's some impressive uh, work of software engineer at Cisco Systems, TripAdvisor, LinkedIn. I mean, certainly some great companies, and I'm sure you learned some very valuable lessons. I'm curious. This is a, a different kind of question. What are the things that you've learned that you since had to actively unlearn? Things like bad habits, poor processes, self defeating beliefs. Anything that you had to cut loose to take your programming and business success to the next level. Hmm. Um, there's a bunch. <laughs> there's many, many things I did wrong uh, and probably still do wrong. Actually, one of the kind of funniest realizations in my life is every every year around New Year's, I'll look back and you think back like what you were doing three or five years ago. And still to this day, every single year I look back, and I'm like, man, I was such an idiot back then. <laughs> um, so I don't know if that means I'm just an idiot or if I'm getting smarter. I, I guess we'll find out eventually. <laughs> Are there any um, specific things you could pass on to our, our yeah, listeners? Yeah, of course, of course. Um, so one of the biggest ones, I think I didn't learn this until I joined LinkedIn and I was basically doing it wrong up until then, is what you do at a job isn't really defined by your job title. 
So I kind of had this mentality where my job title is software engineer or whatever it was at the time. And so the things I will do are basically the software engineering things and basically whatever my boss tells me to do and nothing else. That's my job. My job is that. And I think the reality is that, first of all, relying on a title to determine what you do is kind of the worst way to do things, right? If the only reason that someone can explain why you should do something is because they are a boss and you are not, or because they're a VP and you are not, that's kind of the weakest possible justification you can give for anything. That's that's like your parents telling you, you have to do something because I'm your dad and you have to. Um, And so the, the realization I had is... Like, you're not really hired to write code. You're not hired for that one job title. Everyone is hired to make a company successful. And sometimes you you do that by writing code. Sometimes you do it by doing something completely different. So at LinkedIn, I kind of stumbled into this, and it's had a pretty profound uh, impact on my career at the company. But um, at some point, LinkedIn uh, didn't have an engineering blog. There was no place for LinkedIn engineers to talk about the stuff they did, to talk about the open source projects or anything. Um, and at some point, I was just kind of sitting there. I'm like, what if we just make one? What if we just do that, right? <laughs> like, yeah. my boss isn't asking me to. My job title isn't like blog editor or anything like that. But I'm like, what if we just create one? Um, talked to a few people. Everyone seemed excited, made it happen. Now LinkedIn has a blog that gets just crazy amounts of traffic. Mm-hmm. Um same thing with like LinkedIn used to have internal hack days where once a month we uh, folks would be allowed to just kind of work on whatever they want for one day a month. Um, kind of had the idea of, well, what if we do that publicly? What if we invite a bunch of uh, interns from all around Silicon Valley during the summer and have them come and hack on stuff here? Um, again, nobody tells you to do it. It's not officially part of my job to go put together public hack days or do any of these sorts of events. But you, you make an effort, you convince people it's worth doing because of compelling arguments, not because of your job title, and you can make it happen. And when you do that, your job really changes. And then you kind of have this even more profound realization where you realize that even the job titles people are using are inherently limiting. So I see a lot of people who describe themselves as a, a Java programmer or a C++ programmer or a front-end developer. And to me, that that title, I mean, if you're using it because you want to attract a certain type of employer, that's fine. If it's basically, you know, you're doing search engine optimization, good for you. But if you actually think of yourself as a Java programmer, I feel like that's incredibly limiting because Java, C++, front end, whatever that language or tool set is, they're just that. They're just tools. And to me, describing yourself that way is a little bit like a carpenter describing themselves as like a, a hammer carpenter, right? I'm, yeah. I'm really good with a hammer. <laughs> I'm amazing with a hammer. Um, but that's not why you hire a carpenter. I don't hire carpenters so they can hit things with a hammer all day. I hire them to build a house or a table or something like that. And so uh, I think it's the idea of just being, of just thinking beyond these job titles, beyond these limited things and thinking about how do you actually, what is the most important thing you can be doing at the job and why are you not doing that? So that that was a pretty big change. Um, the other really major one, and I think, I think this one affects almost all programmers to some extent, uh, is I used to believe that if I write really good code, if my code is really fast and it's really elegant and it, it solves the problem correctly, and I have all these great automated tests that I will be successful in my career. And the reality is that's just not how it works. The reality is you, you not only need to do good work, you do have to do good work. I mean, there's no getting around that. You do have to write good code. Uh, but other people have to know about it as well. Mm-hmm. And and that's the piece that I think I was missing for a long time in my career is just this this if you build it, they will come mentality just doesn't work. And it doesn't work whether you work for a company and someone else is your boss, or if you have your own company and you're your mm-hmm. own boss, it, this mentality does not work. Um, you have to make sure other people know what you're doing. Now, as a programmer, I used to be very cynical about that, right? I used to think, oh, I, I don't want to be going around and showboating and thumping my chest and trying to like convince everyone. But that's not really what I'm talking about here. Um, I think the realization I had is if people don't know you're doing a good job, uh, that's actually probably a pretty good sign that you're not working on the right thing (laughs) because it just Mm -hmm. doesn't matter to them. 
Um, so even if you are doing a good job, it's not a good use of your time or you're not working on it in the right way. And so there's a lot of stuff you can do. So some of the things that I started doing um, once I've had this realization is uh, if you're working at someone else, uh, for somebody else, um, what can you do to make sure your boss and your team members and your peers know about your work? Um, there's a bunch. One, write some blog posts about it. It's good, it's, right? It's, it's yep. very simple. And it's funny to like tell team members at your own company what you're doing by writing a public blog post. But that's actually how it works. Like That's what people are going to notice. You could do a talk. You could do a talk within the company, like some sort of brown bag lunch. You could do a public talk at a conference. You can open source your work. You can teach other developers how to use your stuff. Go out to them, talk to them, say, hey, I built this amazing library. I think you guys should be using it. We should work together and make it better. Write documentation. Again, another thing developers hate doing, but it's not only useful, but it actually makes people yeah. notice the work more likely to use it. So there's a whole bunch of these things you can do that ensure that all of that amazing code you're writing is actually getting noticed. You're getting the recognition for it. And there's something else that's really interesting about it, which is it's actually a very virtuous cycle. So once people start noticing your work, they start giving you feedback. And that is actually what makes your work really good. So you might think your code is beautiful and elegant. And then the first five users at your company start using it and you find out very quickly it's not particularly elegant and they have no idea what's mm -hmm. going on. But it's that feedback that makes your code better. And that's actually how you write good code is by getting other people to use it, getting their feedback, feeding that in, and kind of repeating that cycle over and over. So I guess those are the two biggest things yeah. is don't just build things and, and hope everything else will work out and uh, don't assume your job is your job title. Those, those are great pieces of advice. Uh, so we want to move on to your, your book, uh, Hello Startup. So in, in the book, you cover uh, a lot of ground on the best approach to be a successful programmer uh, running a startup. If you could choose one nugget of wisdom uh, from the book to, to tell our listeners, what, what would it be? <laughs> uh, it's, uh, it's a 600 page book. <laughs> so it's going to be interesting <laughs> n narrowing that down to one item. Um, let me think, uh, probably, probably the most interesting thing that I, that I've realized that's been really helpful at taking on a whole variety of, of projects for me is, uh, this idea of uh, incrementalism. So very often when you see some sort of a product, um, what you're actually seeing is this very polished, finished end result of a really long process. But you don't realize that. You see an iPhone or you see some sort of beautiful car and you just assume the designer, the creators of that thing came up with that that way on day one, right? Like Steve Jobs sat down and drew a picture and it was exactly the iPhone we have today. <laughs> And, and that's not how things work at all, ever. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think yep. any product in history has ever been built that way. And in fact, if you actually look at the stories behind most startups, behind most products, um, you'll find out that the initial idea looked only vaguely like the final product, if at all. And a lot of these things happen kind of organically, almost by accident. I mean, you look at the stories of companies like PayPal and Twitter and Instagram and Flickr, and all of these companies were building something completely different until they finally found that niche through a lot of trial and error. And so I think part of this incrementalism idea is when you're taking on these big, hard challenges, a big project at work, or you're starting a company is don't assume you're going to solve it on day one. Don't put so much pressure on it to make it perfect on day one because it's, it's not going to be. And in fact, try to plan out the project using this idea of incrementalism. So incrementalism means you, you break down a large, large task into small steps. But the real key is not just that they're small steps. It's that each of those steps should be valuable by itself. And so even if the project doesn't go all the way to completion, either because you pivot and go do something else or because the project was canceled or some other high priority thing came up, it was still worth doing however many parts of the project you actually got through. Um, and this is actually, by the way, the, the whole core, this idea of incrementalism, this is kind of the core of what we call agile, of what is called the lean methodology, all of these things, they are built around the same core concept, which is do things in small steps, and each of those steps should deliver something of value. Um, it's also, by the way, a really good way to, to decide whether you should do a large project or not. Uh, which is, imagine you're thinking about starting a company. Uh, th this, by the way, had a 
<laughs> this was a really interesting realization for me. So I, I don't know if you guys have looked at the stats. Um, the average amount of time it takes from founding a company to some sort of an exit, like an IPO where you get acquired or something like that, the average amount of time is about eight years. Wow. And, uh, and of course, if you're the founder, that's not really an exit for you, right? That exit yeah. is mostly for investors. As a founder, after an IPO or acquisition, you're still going to be around for another few years. So building a successful company takes 10 years. Hmm. In fact, building any complicated project, building a database, I think Spolsky had a great uh, blog post about this, building a database, building an operating system, building yeah. a company, these are all projects that take on the order of a decade. Yeah. And so for me, I used to have this really long list of startup ideas that I kept in a Google Doc. And once I realized this number, I kind of went back to that list and looked at it and said, how many of these could I actually see myself doing for a decade, right? <laughs> Can I see myself 10 years from now doing nothing but this for, you know, minimum eight hours a day? And a lot of those ideas are real. like once, once you have those numbers, I realized we're very much just get rich quick schemes. But, uh, and so I threw them away. Of the ones that were left... Basically, the question I asked was, uh, what happens if this if I take on this idea and I fail before I get to that ten year mark or whatever you know the the time period is? Um, and there's a lot of ideas where that would be really depressing, right? There's a lot of companies that people start where if that company doesn't have an IPO or an acquisition or some really amazing event like that, it wasn't worth doing. Mm -hmm. It would basically just be an awful experience for all 10 years, and you'd probably never get there. You probably won't succeed. Most companies do fail. Um, so again, I threw away another huge proportion of, uh, portion of my ideas that I just didn't think would be worth doing if I couldn't be happy at every incremental step of the way. And so the company I did end up find, uh, founding, uh, Gruntwork, is stuff that I work on anyway. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's stuff that I do in my spare time. It's stuff that I think about all the time. It's how do I make developers more, uh, including myself, of course, uh, more successful, more productive, more effective. Um, these are things that even if my company failed in a month or in a year or in five years, it still would have been worth working on that. I would have learned a whole mm -hmm. bunch of new things. I would have built a bunch of technologies that in the worst case, if I can't sell them, I'll open source them and use them in future products. Um, I get to work with some really interesting customers. I get to work with an awesome co-founder. So that's kind of how I think about large projects is what happens if you fail before you get to that, you know, magical end state. Nice. Uh, so that's probably it's, the biggest lesson from the book, incrementalism. <laughs> yeah. Very cool. Yeah, a lot of people refer to, inc I mean, incrementalism I've heard oftentimes is iterations. You know, you're iterating through, you know, cycles, agile, you know, build, measure, learn, and the lean methodology. So uh, along that line of thinking, uh, you talk about A-B testing in your book, and uh, it certainly is a great way to iterate and to incrementally improve your product. So I I'm curious, though, A-B testing is generally orchestrated by a product team. So how do you see the role uh, of the programmer as being a more active participant in A-B testing process? Yeah, that's a great question. So uh, I guess if, if anyone out there doesn't know, A-B testing, the idea is instead of just making decisions based on your intuition. You think this product or this feature will be better than this other one. You build both and you release them both, but you assign a random subset of users to version A and a random subset to version B. And then you literally just look at the data and the data will hopefully tell you which of those is actually performing better. Um, so as an example, at, at LinkedIn, uh, we had a page where people could pick a subscription uh, and there's several different subscription options and that's one of the ways LinkedIn uh, makes money. And the intuitive way would have been, okay, let the designer pick the image that goes at the top of the page and then we'll just build it and we'll ship it and it'll be great. Uh, but we decided to A-B test it and we tried four different images at the top of the page. One of them had uh, a young guy on it, one of them had a young woman, one had an older guy, one had an older woman, a whole bunch of flavors. And you wouldn't intuitively assume it's going to make that much of a, of a difference, but the result was the image of the older guy, for whatever reason, ended up performing much, much better. Somehow people felt more confident signing up for a subscription with an elderly gentleman on the front page. Um, I, I don't really know why. All I know is we did an A-B test, or I guess A-B test is two buckets. Then you have, uh, you, you can also do multivariate testing with more than two buckets. Mm -hmm. um, 
And the, the result was LinkedIn made more money. Like <laughs> literally we were a more viable business because of a single simple experiment. Um, so as a programmer, th this is a really interesting thing because I mean, what is A-B testing? It, fundamentally, it's just a fancy word for what we call science, right? Instead of just making things up and assuming you're right, you have a hypothesis and you test it by gathering data. And either you support the hypothesis or you disprove it. And so as a programmer, um, hopefully science is something that you like to do. Um, and data is something that you pay attention to and respect. And so... I think some of the things you can do to, to, to take advantage of this is, one, if your company is not doing A-B testing, um, raise awareness of it. Uh, it doesn't work in all cases, but if you have a reasonable amount of traffic, if you have enough data that you can gather, um, it's an amazing way to make mm -hmm. decisions. So A, just raise awareness. Just make sure people understand there's this thing called science and that data helps you make better decisions. And there's a million case studies out there that you can reference. B, um, as with most things in the world, if it's too hard to do, people generally don't do it. So if you can make A-B testing very, very easy to do in your product, people will take advantage of it, um, which means build some tools. So this is yep. one of those places where if your company is not already doing it and it's not in your job title, building a quick A-B testing framework is something that people will really appreciate. And then you go out to your coworkers and you tell them about it and all of a sudden, boom, you get a promotion. So there's a lot of ways to do this sort of A-B testing stuff. Mm -hmm. The easiest one is just have some sort of a configuration file you can update quickly. Yeah. And basically in your code, say, if the config says version A, use version A. And if it says version B, use version B. Um, you can do some fancier things, though, which are called feature toggles. Um, and so basically you have a live service. And you actually query that service and you ask it, hey, do I show feature A or feature B? And what's cool about it is you, you'll quickly find out as a programmer there's another use for exactly the same set of technology that isn't just A-B testing, which is uh, you can do what's called dark launching. So every time you build a new feature, you basically wrap it in an if statement. And it says, if this feature toggle says this feature is enabled, show it. If not, don't show it. And by default, all feature toggles return false. In other words, don't show it. Mm -hmm. What that lets you do is you can write code, wrap it in the SIF statement. You can check it in even before the code is done, as long as it compiles and it's still stable. But it doesn't have to be done. It doesn't have to be beautiful because by default, none of your users will see it. So now you can do these really large projects incrementally by breaking them up into a bunch of small commits that don't all have to be 100% finished. You can deploy code to the site even though the feature might not be finished. You can roll back if, if necessary, but basically as long as the code is stable, you should be fine. Um, and then you can turn on the feature when it's ready, when you think it's finally done after you know, 10 more commits or whatever. And the really interesting thing about that is now you've separated the release process from the deployment process. So you can deploy code versus releasing a new feature completely separately. So that reduces risk, and that lets you gather data on how the feature is behaving. It lets you do A-B tests. So basically, you can build this simple tool set of turning things on and off, and you can use it across the organization for a whole bunch of wonderful, powerful features. And feature toggles, by the way, are one of the most uh, ubiquitous tools for, for doing DevOps, yep. for doing microservices, uh, for doing deployments where order doesn't matter. I mean, you basically need the exact same tool set for all of these. So... If you're a programmer and you don't have that tool set, build it. Um, there's also some online services you can find. I think Launch Darkly and a few others that you can use so you don't have to do it from scratch. Yes. Um, but if I was a dev, that's that's what I'd invest time in. Awesome. Yeah, so we want to move on to grunt work. Uh, so the company focuses, uh, uh, from what we see on DevOps, uh, especially AWS, in your experience, where do you see AWS implementations running into the most trouble, and what are people consistently uh, getting wrong, in your opinion? Hmm. Um, so <laughs> the, the background for grunt work is that uh, my co-founder and I, um, we're both developers. We've both been building and launching stuff for a long time. And the, the problem that we've always run into is it's a horrific pain. <laughs> I don't know why. I don't know how many times you guys have gone through this process, but launching something is always more painful than you expect it will be. 
And what's really weird about this is nothing in the DevOps world, nothing in AWS, none of these things are actually complicated, right? Elon Musk is, is launching rockets to Mars. That's actually a hard problem to solve. But running a server in AWS is not hard. The reason it's such a pain is because there isn't one thing you need to do. There's mm -hmm. 300 things you need to do. You need to figure out how you're going to do automated deployment. You're going to have to figure out how you do monitoring and alerting. and How do you manage SSH keys? And how do you uh, set up an SSL certificate and load balancing? And do you remember to back up your data? Da, da, da. There's, there's like 300 of these tasks. Yep. Each of them is pretty easy. But when you add 300 things together, each of which takes a week or so, uh, you get kind of a big number. Um, so the biggest issue that I've seen uh, with AWS, and then this happens with other cloud providers as well, is simply that people become overwhelmed. Um, there's just way too many of these little individual tasks to do. And frankly, most companies don't do them. <laughs> they just mm -hmm. don't do them. Hmm, how should we encrypt our secrets, uh, including the password to our database? <laughs> My God, it's like 14 steps to do this. You know what? We're just going to put it in plain text in a file. And we're yep. just going to check it for version control. And let's do that. How do we do monitoring and alerting? Oh, God, it's like 23 steps to hook up this like monitoring and, and distributed tracing system. You know what we're going to do? We're not going to do it. We'll just SSH and look at log files from time to time. So basically, the biggest problem is people just don't solve most of these problems. <laughs> they, they launch. They have a ton of tech debt. And it slows them down for the rest of the company's history. Um, and until they get to a certain scale, they usually don't have the resources to fix this. So, you know, when you get to like a Google or Facebook scale, yeah, you, you invest very heavily yeah. and you, you make yourself better. But as a tiny startup or as a new project launching, you, you don't have the time for that. So that's why we built a company. <laughs> we are trying to take these very, very common 300 tasks and write them as code and make that code available to people so they don't have to do it from scratch. That's awesome. Yeah, I mean, I think I've had many of those problems. Um, be, being a season, you're a seasoned developer um, and also an entrepreneur uh, running your business, do you get to code as much as you used to? And is that sort of an annoyance if you don't? Or I'm just curious. Uh, so we're still a young, small company. So I do get to code plenty, which cool. is awesome. Um, <laughs> One of the things as an entrepreneur is you do end up doing other tasks as well. And for some people, those are great. For some people, they, they can't stand that kind of thing. So that is one of the things you have to watch out for. If you're thinking of starting a company, you have to be excited about things like, I want to build the landing page for my, for my company. I want to organize an office space for my company. I like figuring out how much toilet paper we need to order for next <laughs> month, right? Like there's all sorts of these random silly things that yep. you're going to have to do that as a programmer working for someone else, you typically don't have to think about. It. Yep. Um, so there is time spent on that. So you don't get to spend 100% of your time coding, but you don't get to spend 100% of your time coding at any job. Um, and I find that the stuff that I'm doing here that isn't coding is still rewarding because it's moving this company towards this, you know, what's so cool about a company is you get to sit down and you get to come up with a vision. You get to sit there and daydream and imagine a world that's different than it is today. And then you literally get to take steps to, to move towards that world. You may or may not succeed, but you at least get to make that effort. And so even when I'm doing stupid things like ordering toilet paper, it's still you feel connected to this like big vision that you want to accomplish. And so I, I don't mind doing it at all. Um, but I still do get to write a ton of code. Um, That's good. <laughs> been spending uh, a little too much time coding recently. So I'm going to be <laughs> spending a lot of time with customers this week. Um, but it varies. Uh, one of the things that I did learn. Uh, so for, for, for the book, Hello Startup, I interviewed programmers from, a whole bunch of the most successful startups of the last decade, including Facebook and Twitter and Google and Instagram and Pinterest, and et cetera. And there is a pretty common theme that above a certain size, if you're a founder of a company, your coding time does drop pretty drastically. Um, that size is probably, I mean, it depends on the company, on the founder, but typically if you have uh, 20 employees, you're going to be spending something like a quarter of your time just dealing with uh, management, essentially. Uh, by the time you're over 100, you're going to be spending probably 75% of your time, if not more. So somewhere in between those two, you go from coding regularly to like, oh my God, I haven't written a line of code in, in a month. <laughs> um, 
And there's ways to mitigate that, but that that's the typical outcome in most companies. Nice. Cool. So, so Gruntworks sells pre-assembled infrastructure packages for AWS. And I'm curious, thinking about how there's so many things, even on the front end side, of pre-built modules and libraries and frameworks, the distinction of what used to be custom one-off development that now becomes these packages that can be reused and resold. And what do you think are the implications for future of, of software development? That's a great question. Um, you know, somebody, one of our early customers, when we described what we do, um, explained to us what we do <laughs> in much better terminology, where he said, what we do is the undifferentiated heavy lifting. So it's something that's hard. In other words, it takes a long time, right? Figuring out all these 300 little details takes a long time. But it's exactly the same for almost every single company. Um, maybe if you get to Google scale, again, you have your own unique set of requirements. But if you're between zero and 500 employees, um, most of your infrastructure pieces are going to look the same. And uh, it's more than infrastructure. So we're focused today on the DevOps world because it's just it's the way it is today. It's the Wild West and it's just very, very ripe for, for disruption. But I think it's the same thing, like, like you said, in, in, in the front end part of the world, like uh, assembling your own stack with JavaScript and Webpack and SaaS and like 300 other little front end technologies is just as painful and just as big of a waste of time if it looks like everyone else's. Um, and I think what we're going to see is we're going to see more and more of these uh, high level, we call them infrastructure packages, but I, I'm sure there'll be different names in different parts of the, of the stack. Um, and, and, and you saw this before, right? That the analogy we typically use is, is Ruby on Rails. So uh, not that Ruby on Rails was the first web framework, it certainly wasn't, but it's kind of one of the most popular, one of the most famous ones. Um, and it serves as a good story, which is kind of before the days of Ruby on Rails and things like it. If you wanted to build something for the web, you would go and you would find a web server. And then you would go and figure out what templating technology to use. And then you would go and find some sort of a database library. You would go and figure out how to configure things. And basically, you'd go and spend all this time assembling, again, 300 little pieces. And along comes Ruby on Rails. And it says, look, we took an opinionated approach. It has all of those pieces already built in and they're tested together and they work together and it has a pretty decent experience. And it's going to work for, again, 80% of use cases, not everyone for sure, but for many, many use cases, it's going to do everything you need it to do. And now people just start with Ruby on Rails instead of starting with a custom web framework from scratch. And I think that's going to happen more and more in the industry. I think people are going to do it in the DevOps world. Why assemble your own Docker cluster? Why assemble your own network topology? Why assemble your own SSH key management when it's going to look exactly like everyone else's? Um, and I think it's going to happen in the front end stack. I think it's going to happen all over the place. We're going to see more and more of these packages, frameworks, whatever you want to call them. Nice. Yeah. Um, so this is our, our final question. What advice would you give to developers who are thinking about starting their own businesses? <laughs> um, so one is read my book. <laughs> it's, it answers that question over about 600 pages. So uh, that's useful. The, the, the shorter version is a couple things. So one, what I mentioned earlier in the talk, um, building a successful company is a decade long project. And you really need to keep that in mind. Like you need to be ready to work, not ready, but like want to work very much want to spend the next decade of your life working on this problem. Don't take on a problem just because you think you're going to get rich because you're not going to succeed and you're not going to get rich if you approach it that way. Um, so that's one is just be aware of the time scale because that, as I said, it had a really profound impact on which ideas I thought were even worth pursuing. Um, on top of that, I think the other piece that as a programmer, so if, if you're a developer, if you're a technical person, you're going to have decent ideas on how to build things. But the, the other piece that I think you are likely to be missing is this, is this marketing aspect, um, which I talked about earlier as well, which is if you build it, they will come. That doesn't work with a career at someone else's company, and that really, really doesn't work with a company. Um, you can build the most amazing software, write the most amazing code, and if nobody knows that your company exists, you're still going to go out of business really, really quickly. Um, 
And so think very, very carefully on day one on how you basically what is the distribution strategy for your company? How are people going to find out that you exist? How are you going to convince them that your product is worth using? And don't just assign that to some other salesperson or some other marketing person. You as the founder should be deeply involved with that from day one. You should be going out, honestly, and talking to people, talking to potential customers before you write a single line of code. Which, again, as a programmer, is really hard. As a programmer, my instinct is always, I'm going to go lock myself in a room, and I'm going to write code all day, and somehow I'll be successful. And, and that just it doesn't work. It really does not. Um, you need to go out there. You need to talk to people. And this is part of this awareness thing, and it'll make your product better. So not only will these folks then be aware of your product and maybe buy it, um, but they'll also give you feedback. And that feedback will make your company better. It'll make your product better. Chances are it'll change what your product is, just like it did for Twitter and Instagram and all these other companies that had these major pivots. Um, so, yeah, th those are the two probably biggest takeaways for me. Is it's a, it's a decade project. And if you're a developer, the piece you'll need to think a lot about, uh, basically your weakness is probably going to be this marketing aspect. Awesome. That's very useful. Uh, just real quick, how do you feel about starting a company as a side project versus quitting your job and going full time right away, sink or swim? Uh, I, I think that's not a terrible strategy if you think of it at, based on the, that incrementalism idea that I mentioned. So you can start testing your ideas incrementally while you still have another job. Put up a landing page, buy some ads, start a Kickstarter campaign, build a really simple MVP, or just talk to customers, honestly. Go out and have a chat with a few potential customers. And what you want is you want people committed to giving you money before you start the company. That's basically the gold standard. And things like a Kickstarter campaign are actually a really obvious way to make that happen. But you can do that, obviously, just by talking to a customer and say, hey, if I had this tomorrow, would you buy it? And the guy starts taking out his checkbook. That's a really good sign. And you can definitely do that while you still have another job. Once you're on to something that has a little bit of traction, it's going to start becoming all-consuming, and you're going to have trouble yeah. balancing the two. But at that point, you'll also have enough confidence to leave your job. So you don't have to necessarily take, the, take a giant risk without any, um, without any idea if it'll work. Um, so I think that's a good strategy, even if you are doing it full-time, but especially if you're doing it as a side project. That's a great answer. Well, that looks like it wraps it up today with Jim Berkman, programmer, entrepreneur, and author. Jim, thanks for being on DevRamp Podcast. Hey, thanks so much for having me, guys. Yeah, that was that was really uh, interesting. Um, I, I really enjoyed when Jim talked about incrementalism because I think that's a really important thing for developers. And you know, looking on on the Debra and app, something that a lot of people miss uh, when we like you know try to do everything in in one shot and and we're not iterating and, and we're not actually getting an MVP into the wild. Yeah, I agree. I think that's what a lot of people hate about agile. Is it Agile gets forced down your throat, and the idea is I have the sprint, but the idea is the sprint is that every sprint, you're literally building something step by step, and you have something to show for it at the end of that sprint. But yet, product managers, you know, stakeholders try and jam down this huge thing, it just doesn't fit, and then it's just it's this wrong tool for the wrong job. Yeah. I'm kind of jumping back to what he first started with, you know, getting started with games and, you know, an HTML. Yeah. I think that's so much that we've heard kind of a pattern with all the people we've talked to is just kind of hacking on some of the, the fun stuff that as, as a teenager just really excites you and yeah. you know that low hanging fruit, certainly the, the, the web, the markup language that you get to play with and the visual feedback makes it just so, so easy and approachable. Uh, and it's definitely, I think where a lot of people start. You yeah. Get, you get hooked. That's that's how I started Flash Games. Uh, me, me and my friend in a Flash game company, and and, and that was so much fun. Um, it's in interesting. I wonder what will happen. No, no more <laughs> Flash soon, but <laughs> yeah. Sorry, Flash. <laughs> One thing he said that was uh, jumped out at me was talking about that timeline for being an entrepreneur, hmm. and that you know it can take a decade. Like, don't get yourself invested yeah. in something you're not passionate about. You can sustain for that long a period of time. Uh, I, I certainly the appeal of get rich quick is 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 uh, is exciting. You see people in TechCrunch and you know in the tech news that you know have million dollar exits, ten right. million, hundred million dollar exits within a few months, and you're like, wow, I could do that too. And yeah. but that's that's those are outliers. Uh, those are people winning the lottery. Like yeah, for most of us, it's that long plow. 
I, I was surprised. I think you said something like eight years. Like that. That was like what? No, that's eight to ten years. Yeah, that's that's amazing. Because you you don't you never you never hear about that really. You only hear like you were saying the the ones that are that are quick. Do it because it's fun. Do it because it's your passion. Yeah. So, hopefully the money will come. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Fingers crossed. <laughs> Next up, we have a developer from our community with us. He goes by Kebab on DevRant. Hi, Kebab. Welcome to the show. Yes, thanks for having me. To start off, we're going to do a dramatic reading of your all caps, straight from the heart rant. So, Kebab, let's hear from you. All right. Fuck my boss when he says he didn't see any UI changes after not sleeping for 24 hours to get the entire backend rewrite done. I went over the actual changes with him a hundred fucking times. I get this message after finally grabbing some food. What did you do? You said you were going to work on the site. Fuck, fuckity fuck. <laughs> Fuck your money and your job, and while I'm at it, fuck web dev. Fuck you guys. I'm going home. End rant. Thank God for dev rant. <laughs> <laughs> Drop the mic, walk off stage. That's great. <laughs> um, so, so is there anything else you could you could tell us uh, ab- about your boss? Yeah. Um, in fact, <laughs> after I posted this, I was thinking, man, I actually left out insulting his intelligence while I was at it. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but no, really, he's um full design guy so he doesn't really understand the entire uh, coding process i guess you could say and the work that goes into that so if he doesn't see something done on the front end basically like nothing happened (laughs) yeah that's that that sucks those designers you don't don't trust (laughs) tim's a tim's a design guy (laughs) (laughs) oh yeah i i can't wait to be out of this job though i've been working on this site for a while now so it's been been quite a journey. <laughs> it's, it sounds like. It. Yeah, sometimes you have to interview your bosses too as part of the process. <laughs> yeah, I won't be making that mistake again. Definitely going to watch out. It ended up being closer to contract work, I guess. So I'm kind of locked into it now, but, mm. you know, get through it. <laughs> yeah. What, what kind of project is it uh, as you tearing your hair out? Um, so it's a uh, custom CMS that's written to display... I won't get in like too much detail, but uh, yeah, yeah. basically it's for displaying media, and uh, all of it has to be custom backend and whatnot for the nature of the media that's being displayed. And um, yeah, so we started off with something because he's terrible with deadlines, literally. So <laughs> the whole nature of this, um, <laughs> he messaged me that day and was like, "Hey, this needs to be done by tomorrow." I'm like, "All right, I'll get it done." And like, no, like it needs to be live tomorrow oh my god <laughs> of course like, i mean this is gonna take like a couple of weeks to get done it's like no it's it's got to be live like it's i'm going out of country after this i won't be able to communicate with you like it needs to be live like there's people expecting it to be up i'm like well already so just didn't sleep that night and got um the functioning part done for it and then then this shit storm happened messaged me in the morning i was like god damn just after this hell of a night <laughs> <laughs> cool but, yeah so this is our speed round we're just going to ask you uh some quick questions and uh you could just use one word answers that's that's fine um so first question favorite programming language i gotta be c plus plus favorite ide it hurts but i'd have to say visual studio oh, I, shit. Hate, <laughs> I hate saying a microsoft product but um I've just used it too much for xbox development and uh for c plus plus and has such a nice debugger and compiler for that so that's that's but, fair uh yeah. mac windows or linux um i like my mac os x actually it's pretty gets the job done not much hassle cool nice spaces or tabs oh uh spaces but the tab button bind it to four spaces nice. <laughs> nice. right emacs vim or fuck them both uh vim yeah i'm a vim guy too <laughs> Uh, so final question, if you could be doing anything in the future, your dream job, what would it be? Um, probably just, uh, working on homebrew projects for different communities, to be honest, just going around to random areas and just, uh, finding a project that needs to get done and building it out. Cause currently there's a lot of like, there's a lot of cool projects with reverse engineering, different operating systems and, uh, software that people just don't have the time or resources to put into yeah. and make it actually decent. So it'd be sweet to actually work on that full time and see those to fruition. That's awesome. Nice. That's it. Uh, 
Yeah, man. Thanks, Bob. Awesome. Yeah. Thanks for having me. Okay. So one thing, a new segment we're doing for this episode is to get some question and answer done through, uh, through dev rant. So we posted a, a rant, uh, asking for uh, some questions to have us answer. And uh, so we're going to go through some of these. The first one is from Cookie. Now that DevRant has really hit it off and has a lot of developers, do you see this platform becoming more than just a place to rant? If so, what do you think this community could evolve to? David? Um, yeah, so I think in, in our latest news update, we sort of touched on this. Uh, we're we're going to be launching something called Collabs, uh, where people could find other developers to collaborate with on open source projects, uh, different kinds of projects. So that that's one way uh, it, it'll be evolving past rents. And, and, you know, I think we've always been about, um, we're, we're sort of democratic. We want, we want what users uh, enjoy. And, you know, I, we, we, we could see it evolving a little more. What, what, what do you think, Tim? Yeah, I, I mean, I always saw DevRent as a place to be a community for developers. And, you know, we didn't put any hard and fast rules other than what's in the name as far as what it is. Yeah. So it is that democratic process. The upvote, downvote is what developers, and it's just developers here uh, as a very singular population, tend to get tend to appreciate. Some of them is, you know, it's jokes and memes, and that's that's a part of it. Uh, so as it evolves, you know, it becomes just a social place that developers hang out in. And we just want to keep that focus on developers. And how it goes from there is sort of just up to the how things how things evolve. Excellent. Uh, next question from Arlekin. Do you, and if so, how, plan to keep the quality of community along DevRan's growth and changes? It is well known that bigger communities tend to have easier time getting toxic. Example, Stack Overflow. Yeah, no, it's, it's a great question. Uh, certainly something we want to avoid. Uh, thankfully, a lot of our uh, moderation process is automated. You know, you know, the downvoting, the upvoting, the algorithmic feed, uh, helps keep things from getting out of control in a lot of ways. As they get bigger, I think I think Stack Overflow, you know, is toxic for different reasons. People are very elite about the answers because it matters to have precision and everything else. Mm -hmm. DevRan is more of like a fun social place, so that's just not necessary to be, you know, that uptight about the quality of answers. Um, the quality. You know, one thing we worry about is, you know, reposts or like subdivisions of things. Like, should we start to have, you know, smaller, like mini, mini conversations that break away from the main feed? Is that something that makes sense? I, I feel like we need a certain degree of scale uh, to have those subdivisions take place. And we're not there yet, uh, but it's something we think about. This is from Vin uh, Vringard. Even though it's kind of impolite to ask, how are your finances looking do you need additional funding? And would you allow us to crowdfund it? I would much prefer crowdfunding over ads or anything of sorts. Um, finances uh, are, are good. We, we, we don't have a ton of expenses. We subsidize some of it with, with the swag store. So whenever you buy swag, you're helping us out uh, a little bit. Um, crowdfunding, we, we've considered... Um, you know, the part of the problem where I, I always seen with the crowdfunding campaign is it takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of time to, uh, to run. Um, and I'm not really sure if that's the best avenue for us right now. Um, we, we are, we did talk about collabs and, and there will be a fee associated with collab listings. So what, what we've always seen is, you know, we're, we're going to look into, you know, having add-ons or, or whatever, we're never going to charge for, for the core experience, you know, um, but, but the possibility uh, of, of add-ons that, that you use, you know, within the app is, is something we're, we're considering. So next question from GMF, how difficult is it to develop and run DevRent whilst having a nine to five job? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, I find it uh, pr pretty difficult at, at times. And I think a lot of it comes down to, uh, I think there's a lot more that, that we, we want to be doing, or, you know, we, we could be doing a lot more. For instance, I think this podcast is, is a perfect example. We, we, we've had so much on our plate that it's taken us a long time to, to finish up this episode. Um, and there's just, there's just a lot of stuff that, that we want to do. Uh, so I think that's, that's where the difficulty is, um, just getting everything done that we want to do. Yeah, I mean, it's also just sacrificing sleep. <laughs> yeah. So being tired and dealing with that, uh, you know, we stay up pretty late getting stuff done um, besides our regular demands. So 
you know, it's just uh, you make some sacrifices and you know, that's, that's just what it takes. Hopefully, you know, some years later, we have, uh, you know, full time focus on this that uh, we'll be able to sleep. <laughs> that would be nice. Uh, next question from ASGS. Is there any plan to hire more programmers to work for DevRent? Of course, this question applies if you have plans to expand. Uh, right now, uh, we're keeping it pretty lean. Uh, our finances are good, but not that good. <laughs> so uh, it's uh, not in the near future. But uh, you know, as thing comes up, I'm certainly will be tapping in the community. Next question from J. C. Kimball. I have two, although the first might not have a lot of interest. Uh, number one, how well is Neo4j perform- performing for DevRent? How many instances are y'all currently running? And how easy is it for y'all to scale up? I mean, I, th- I think that that's an interesting question that I w- I'm hoping our, our listener base might be interested in. Um, right now, we have four instances we're running Uh they're decently beefy. They're, they're where most of our hosting expense uh, lies in, in the database ser- servers. They're performing great. The, uh, the number one bottleneck right now or, or what requires um, the most processing power is our uh, algorithm. Our, our algo sort is, is pretty complex. It, it's got a lot going on, um, a lot going on in the background that, that, that you never see with a collaborative filtering um, and a lot along those lines. That's definitely been the, the, the hardest scaling challenge uh, to date. Um, so, you know, I'm going to continue looking at that, seeing how we can optimize it. Um, but and, and a lot of it comes down to, you know, time it takes to, to, to work on that. Um, I haven't been able to fully optimize it. But yeah, a, a, as a whole, Neo4j is performing great. And we don't even really have a, a strong caching layer or any caching layer over most of the app. Um, second question, I remember something being said before about the DevRamp programming not being really impressive for an open source (laughs) project, but is there any plans on putting the code on GitHub where the DevRamp community can help you with your workload? It's not like a lot of us wouldn't mind helping move this project along and it could help new developers learn by example. Um, you know, you know, for that one, yeah, I had said a while ago that I don't think the code is really up to par to open source. Um, and, and that pretty much still stands true. I, I, I look at Reddit and, uh, I, I believe they open source after they, they were funded. Um, cause the, cause the way I see open sourcing a code base as big as ours, that, that would kind of be like a, like a full-time job in the beginning, getting it up to speed to open source, uh, f- maintaining an open source project is, is, is a lot of work. Um, so I, I would kind of see that as something we could look at when we're, when we're a little bit bigger, hopefully. Great. Uh, this is from Jamoy Jamie. If you were a programming language, which would you be and why? Same goes for JS frameworks. <laughs> this is a good one. Timmy, what, which, which one would you be? Uh, I think I, I'd be JavaScript. You know, it's, it's simple, it's ubiquitous, kind of does what it needs to do in a lot of different places, front end, back end, you know, all over the place. Uh, I'd have to create a name for it. Maybe uh, Timmy JS. <laughs> I, like, I like it. I guess I would be PHP because uh, because I'm, I'm I'm a little bit lame in in some cases and PHP kind of has has that rep. Um, but but then then on the flip I, the flip side I really like PHP. So yeah, PHP. <laughs> okay, this is uh, Raymond. Hi there. I have a question. Uh, that you guys have any plan for web platform, and would you guys like this project to be open source? Um, yeah, so so we have a web app. Uh, a lot of people don't know about it. It's uh, devrand.io slash feed. Uh, that's only available from a desktop uh, machine. Um, and and uh, we plan to improve that a lot. We, we, we have some stuff ready to go for it. We're just trying to, to get that in. Um, and then I think for, for the project to be open source, we touched on that already. Uh, Bell App Lab asks... If you could have a hobby, what would it be? Uh, I have I have a lot of hobbies. Uh, <laughs> you do. I, I take a lot of classes. You really so, do. Uh, yeah, I just finished um, uh, sketch comedy writing class here in New York. Um, I have to get into some more stand up comedy. Uh, you know, oh boy, like, um, dancing and design and VR. I got a five, so kind of into that stuff. Read a lot into like the tech 
uh, science <laughs> scene. I just bought a little uh, home lab, like a CRISPR Cas9 gene editing kit thing. I have to do the little lab lab experiment. You've for, got a lot of hobbies to me. Uh, yeah, ping pong. Play a lot of ping pong. Or used to. It's been a while. Yeah. Martial arts. Don't have martial arts. Um, yeah, a couple of things. Uh, I, for for me, I would say uh, ping pong. What like Tim used to play a lot together. I I still play a lot. Um, trying to get trying to take it to the next level uh and 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 also legos i i I love legos um i've been buying a few sets uh yeah i've always loved that um next question from i like toast what has your thought process discussions been like if any around number one commercial commercialization of the app and number two white labeling the app and creating spinoffs such as pm rant waiter rant hairdresser rant marketer rant etc uh for for number one i think we touched on that um so we'll 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 skip that one uh tim you want to touch on number two sure yeah it's something that we thought about pretty early on is uh is this something we want to build as a platform that's you know interchangeable or do we want to go deep with one vertical and the decision was made pretty early to go deep um when we first discussed this idea, it was, it was like, hey, you know, I was talking to a friend and like, or like talking about how everyone like complains about stuff. I think we could do like a, like a complaining, like a ranting app. And we had just finished an app that hadn't taken off. That was uh, for like news. Uh, it was like a Tinder for news kind of thing. And uh, we're like, ah, it just didn't hit like a single, like, who do you target for that? Like news, everyone reads the news. So it's like hard to target. A specific audience and so that's where it came with the idea of like let's just focus ranging on like one group of people let's just do developers we know developers we can get some early adopters like let's do that uh and and just to kind of focus it and it's allowed us to to really tap into this market of developers uh and know what they want know how they behave and to right. do fun things around that that maybe wouldn't really parallel other communities so well uh i mean the moderation that we do do uh, I mean, certainly this podcast, uh, the cartoons, I mean, even the avatar builder, a lot of this stuff is tied around, you know, what we know about developers. Uh, so to, to, to take it into other arenas, uh, other, um, other demographics, other professions, uh, they're just a whole other communities to really try and understand. And none of us are hairdressers or waiters <laughs> or, or marketers exactly. So uh, it'd be kind of guessing at do these people even need this? Is this something that's there? And then how do we break into that community? Is the community already existing in other places on Reddit, on Twitter, somewhere else that we don't even know about because that's just not something that we circle in. So it's something we've discussed um, right now. It's kind of just dig deeper into solving more needs, more, uh, more things that developers could want. Great answer. Um, from Slat, what rank gave you the idea for this platform? Um, I, I think Tim just touched on it in, in, in the last answer. Uh, you know, we, we would sort of hang out after work, and, and a lot of times, you know, we would rant about sort of developer-related things, company-related things, and, and, and that's where we really got the idea that, hey, you know, we're not the only ones doing this, and, and it would be great to have a platform for this. Yeah. DL Melzi asks, how often do you and T. Rogus fight over changes? Yeah, I mean, sometimes sometimes we have disagreements, but I, I think I think that's important to to making good decisions. I think if we always agreed on everything, then we would make a lot of you know wrong decisions um, and and sort of decisions that don't make sense. I, I look at it a lot like I look at politics, like you know, in, in your cabinet or wherever you want to have people who who have different opinions um, and and who are going to express them and, and and tell you when they disagree. Yeah, I. I, I... I disagree. <laughs> That's not true. I, I agree with what, what David just said. Uh, it's, I would say, a requisite variety. Uh, you know, if everyone's the same, everyone's identical, like one fatal flaw can wipe out an entire population. Uh, oh. And when your company's two people, <laughs> you, need, you need to have some, some variety there. Uh, and we do. You know, we have different backgrounds and different ideas about product uh, and, and how to approach things. So it, it allows for... Um, you know, just intelligent questioning and skepticism, yeah. which uh, is, is healthy. Yeah, I, I think I think it's funny. On, on on that note, when we worked at one of our previous companies, we we, we saw a lot of bad decisions firsthand. Um, so we you know sort of learn from that, and 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 we're careful, and we make sure we vet everything. 
Okay, uh, that was it for questions. So I think we're going to wrap up with some, uh, some DevRant updates to, uh, and what's coming up next. Yeah, so just some quick highlights. Um, since our last episode, uh, we launched a Stories feature, and Stories is a simple way to see long-form rants uh, all in one section of the app. Um, so if you're looking for some really good story like rants, definitely check it out. It's, a, it's accessible from the, uh, from the hamburger menu um, and soon to be in the new navigation. Tim will touch on that in a second. Um, we have some new swag store items. Uh, we have custom avatar stickers, which are really fun, and also cool DevRant baseball caps. Um, we have a list of your recently viewed rants in your profile now. Uh, so if you forgot like one of them that you looked at and you want to go back to it, you just go to that list in your profile. Um, and only you can see that. So don't worry. It's not, it's not public. So what's coming up next for DevRant? Uh, we're excited to introduce a new navigation, uh, method, which we're going to move away from the Hamburg menu, uh, to having, uh, some fixed tabs. And that allows just for a little quicker access to some of the main features of, of DevRan and also some cool new stuff we're adding that we just think, uh, you know, deserves the attention. So uh, look forward to that. That's going to be on iOS and Android. Uh, we also have, you know, some more avatar items coming out soon. A lot of special requests have been uh, put forth. And if there's any or anything you, you want, uh, just hit me up uh, at trogus. Uh, fulfill every request. But if you have special items, uh, let me know and I'll, I'll try my best. Cool. And as uh, David mentioned earlier, we do have the collaboration feature coming out soon. Uh, so that'll be pretty cool just to be able to get your, get your open source project out there, a little bit more exposure. You know, so much stuff that you put out, say, on GitHub, you know, you, you, you're just drowned out in the thousands and thousands of other projects that are all competing for attention. So just a way to get it in front of uh, you know, the DevRan audience and a you know, way to kind of effectively get a featured listing you know, a small, small fee for that, or, you know, much like everything on DevRant, you know, get enough points, you get it for free. So it's pretty cool. Yeah. And just, I'll, I'll, I'll just add one more thing. Um, we, you know, we're, we're always looking to, to improve a, a, all of our algorithms and, and what you, you know, how we recommend content and, and how we display content. Um, you know, there's also, Tim touched on it earlier, um, you know, dealing with repos, dealing with, Grow with things you see with growth, uh, with with more rants and and, and dealing with quality. Um, so we're we're, all, we're always receptive to to ideas around around those things. Um, so you could always let us know if you if you have feedback, and, and that's something. Those those are things we're constantly working on. Yeah. So I mean, certainly, if you guys have any feedback about the product or about the podcast, any guests you'd love to to see on here, uh, just let us know. You know, we're on DevRet, we're on Twitter, Facebook, everywhere. So thank you for listening to the DevRant Podcast. I'm T. Rogus. And I'm D. Fox. Happy ranting. <laughs>